In 20th century Western translation theories, there was this thing called equivalence. And now we can put it in, in chronological order, which at its very birth was undermined by this other thing called indeterminacy. And those two things have been fighting all the way through, I think, giving various partial resolutions. One of them was the theories of equivalence as a linguistic fact. Another partial solution was Scopos theory, the theories of purpose, the theories of, oh, to hell with all the linguistic stuff, we're carrying out actions in the world anyway. That was one way of solving that problem. Another solution was the descriptive paradigm, when they said, well, let's get back and look and get data on what actually happens out in the world, to see what's going on. That's one way of solving that problem, too. Another way was localization. What happened in localization? Technology came in to standardize language, to kill, supposedly, indeterminacy, and allow equivalence to return. And that's about where we are in the story. As I told you that story, can you guess where I am in it? You have a right to know, I think, because no, no storyteller is neutral. Everybody manipulates history to suit their own advantage. Where am I, do you think? Why? I said language is subjective and things to that effect. Yeah. Then again, in each class, I've made you do things to find out. Okay? I really have tried to make you look at this empirically. Empirically just means, don't believe what I say, don't believe what these theorists say. Take the ideas and test them on things you can find. And that would be descriptive in that paradigm. Okay? And in my book, I give two really big chapters to equivalence. And I've been criticized by people as believing in the equivalence. So I could be there too. Um, and I like technology, so I must be into localization. Uh, okay. A, a bit of everything. No, I think you're right. I think you're quite perceptive. I, I think... Um, for most of my life, I've, I've accepted the critique of, of indeterminacy, I've accepted deconstruction. Uh, I believe that there is this fundamental sliding of meaning in communication. I don't believe we really understand each other 100% ever. Then again, I'm not happy with the people in that paradigm, okay? Let me state now what I think about each of these paradigms. This is me, all right? This is not me citing somebody else. Uh, equivalence, I think, is something that exists out in the world. It exists between you and your clients and your readers. It's a functional illusion that's necessary in order for translation, interpreting, to work. So I'm not, I'm not upset that, that it's not true. Come on. Things are not true. Do you think, do you think that when you get sorry, a five dollar bill, this says pay the bearer five dollars of what? Of gold. Do you think there is gold for all the dollars circulating around in the world? It's an illusion, ladies and gentlemen. It's a trick. If you all went and tried to get back your, this in value, you wouldn't get it. The whole economy would be even worse than it is now. Society works through shared illusions. Money is one of them. Equivalence is another. So, just as people do economics, we could do translation theory. Okay, so, I have this critique, but I'm not upset by that critique. With uh, theories of purpose, Skopos theory, I, I think that's straightforward. I think that's self-evident. We carry out actions in the world, uh, we work with uh, clients, we work with uh, end users, no trouble at all. I mean, I was trained in sociology, that's the basis of it, after all. Uh, but, is that a theory that can solve 
theoretical problems? Can that help us if we have to decide between that person and that person? Or that way of translating and that way? Not at all. For me, it's just a banal set of names for things. It's going around the world putting labels, you know. Like you're walking into the middle of a war and you say, well, there's that side there or that side there. It doesn't help you act ethically. And for me, that's the great failing of that paradigm. Similarly, for descriptive studies, I mean, you've got to go out and test things and find out about it. But what the descriptive studies that we have in translations have, have forgotten, in, that we have in translation studies, have forgotten, firstly, is the human translator. Lots of people saying things about translations, but not much about us, the people in it. And just as they forget the subject, subjects are people. Just as they forget the people in what they're studying, they forget that they're also people. There's this illusion of objectivity, of science. And they're forgetting that when they're talking about translation, communication between cultures, they are doing so from within cultures. And work, you know, they, there's no self-analysis either. And I think that's one of the great failings of that paradigm. It has no object-subject dialectic. As for localization, I'm, I'm totally convinced that the technologies that are coming on board, especially statistical machine translation, I'm totally convinced all of that is going to change radically the way we communicate between cultures. So that's the most alive, vital paradigm. But the theories I presented I regard as, frankly, technocratic dehumanization. Uh, they've forgotten about the people who have to interact. They've forgotten especially about the translators. And they're going to turn translation work into donkey work in many respects. Okay, if you don't believe me, go and work for a big localization project, applying a glossary in a translation memory for three months and see how you feel. <laughs> and then you'll know why you have to become a project manager. Anyway, that's for the... <laughs> also for deconstruction, the theorists I've mentioned who work in that paradigm don't do a lot to help us live with the fact of indeterminacy. I mean, it's one thing to say it's there, this is what happens when we communicate or don't communicate, but it's quite another to start saying, well, what do we do about it? What are the problems we still have to solve? We still have to get interaction going between cultures, we still have to realize it's, it's not working well. The main problems we have in this world are not particularly economic, are not polit particularly political in the sense of having goodwill, but they're very profoundly misunderstandings between cultures and mistrust between cultures. So the people working in deconstruction have got the right points to make, but they're not solving the real problems that are out there. And that's what I'm interested in doing. Uh, perhaps it's not just in translation. As it takes more than translation to solve the problems, but communication is very much a part of it. I'll just add in passing that um, I don't think the intellectual work in these paradigms, that is in translation theory, since the 1950s, has been very great. What's happened, I think, and I, I almost hesitate to say it, but I think it's largely true, translation studies, translation theory, has been a small place of intellectual activity, where some big minds have come in for a brief visit and made some intelligent comments. And a lot of small minds have worked forever, reproducing endless opinions and predispositions. If you don't believe me, just look at all the things that people say about the translator should do this, the translation should be like this, you have no right to do... How do you know? It's so boring when you get to... So George Steiner made the point, I think in his book, uh, after Babel, 1978, he said, you know, there are few, few, fewer fields of human inquiry where so many banalities have been repeated so often. And since then, we've been repeating what he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there are not many original proposals. And the, the, the paradigms I presented have been relatively original within a ruck of crass mediocrity.
Okay, now how can I work to try to solve some of the problems that I've raised? I'll deal with this in particular with respect to ethics, the things I talked about last week. Last week I presented Andrew Chesterman's Four Paradigms for Ethics. And I want you to consider if that's what we should be doing. One was about representation. Now, I don't think it's particularly ethical to propagate illusions. But that's what that paradigm is arguing. The other was service. You are loyal to your clients and your readers. I don't think it is particularly ethical to be loyal to tyrants or bad people. The other is to complain about a lack of understanding or to seek understanding. I don't think there is any entire understanding, but I don't think it's enough just to complain about it. A culture of complaint is not a solution either. But there is, I think, a solution beyond all of those previous paradigms to the problem of ethics. And I'll give it to you really quickly. It comes from the basic theory used around us here in government studies, in international negotiation theory. It's been a part of capitalist theory since Adam Smith. And it's this very simple theory of cooperation. And it says simply this, that when we cooperate in anything we do, there are benefits for me and benefits for you. And there's ethical cooperation when everybody benefits. In fact, ethical communication when everybody benefits. That's all we have to know. Think of examples. I usually give examples of getting the rubbish collected from your house. And it's cheaper to get it collected from you and your neighbor's houses together, so you talk and, and organize this together. Okay, and it works because it's cheaper for you to do that than to have it done individually. That's why we communicate. Cooperation. It's not a zero-sum game. If I win, you lose. It's no. Now, if I can get that, that's an established ethics. It's an established field of inquiry in negotiation theory and in economics. And applied to translation, why not? That's done. It's not being said by any of those previous paradigms. I'm going to go a bit further, though, and say I'll use that theory of cooperation, and I'm going to try to see how that applies to cross-cultural communication. Cooperation is why we talk. Why do we talk so much? We want to get on with each other. We want to help each other. And if we shout at each other, it's because we have to sort out the people with whom we can cooperate. Okay? So that's why we also have aggressive communication. We are looking for the partners with whom we can cooperate. I can also explain war, you see. War is a way of looking for partners with whom you can cooperate. Like killing all the other ones. But, <laughs> okay. but communication has this, 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 this double bind situation. Right? Uh, if that's the thing we're looking for, is it attacked by indeterminacy? No. Because everybody decides for themselves if this relationship this communication is beneficial. If it is, they'll keep going. If it isn't, they go and talk with somebody else. There's no assumption of understanding, of complete agreement, of meaning being transferred or messages or anything like that. It's just people achieving benefits from an interaction. And each person decides for themselves what is beneficial. Very, very simple theory that is entirely compatible with the illusion of equivalence and with indeterminism. Very good solution. That's all communication. Then I ask, cross-cultural communication is a particular kind of communication. Why? Because, well, why? Because we have fewer shared references, therefore we have fewer bases for trust. We trust people in our own culture more than we trust people in other cultures. And therefore, there is great risk. Uh, firstly, the actual act of communication takes more effort. So the more effort you invest in communication, the smaller the uh, uh, range of, of beneficial outcomes. OK? 
Okay? Benefit has to be above what you invest in the communicative act. And uh, the greater the risk that the other person will betray you. Okay? Objective. Objective. We have fewer uh, experience to share and therefore uh, less basis for belief in their future actions. So I find there there's greater risk. And then if I go down to the fact of uh, mediated cross-cultural communication, where there are three people involved, I find the risk even greater, the risk of non-cooperation, the risk of betrayal even greater. Remember the chicken and egg story I told you last week. Okay. Translators will not be, intermediaries will not be trusted. So what I find when I go from general communication, chatting at the bus stop, down to mediated cross-cultural communication, which includes translation and interpreting, is greater risk. Greater risk of cooperation not working. Greater risk of people being betrayed. Greater risk of people not getting benefits out of the communicative act. And so, I've been working in cooperation theory and risk management theory. And that's my paradigm. Okay, that's, that's why I'm working there. I, I mentioned this just to indicate that I presented, I don't know how many paradigms, five perhaps? Equivalence, scopus, description, localization, four, indeterminate, five. I presented five, okay? But it doesn't mean that you or I have to belong to any one of them. I think what you've got to do is go out and see problems, try to think of ways to solve them, see what's been done in translation, but also look around at the other disciplines that work on similar things and bring in solutions and paradigms from there. Uh, that's what I've been doing with my particular work at the moment. I might change in one or two years with a different set of ideas. I'm quite open to that. I don't think you live and die in any particular paradigm. And I don't think you should too. I just wanted to open your eyes to some of the alternatives that are available there. There are more alternatives. The whole area of Asian theory I haven't entered because I don't know enough about it. But I'm sure you are able to explore for your own.